<laughs> Thank you, Matt, and uh, cheers. Uh, nice, to, nice to be here. Well, I think Matt described quite adequately what uh, the talk is about tonight, Granville and the tradition that it comes from, the tradition of anthropomorphic characters. Uh, this picture, this is my protagonist, Detective Inspector at, at Lebrock of Scotland Yard, Badger, as you can see. You can't go wrong with a badger with guns, can you? I mean, <laughs> basically. Um, this picture isn't actually in the book. This was done as the sample piece of artwork that went along with the um, uh, promotion, uh, the, 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 promotion, the uh, proposal that I sent out to publishers, you know, when I'm, I'm looking for a publisher at the beginning of that pitch. So this was uh, a pitch to, to show what the, um, the style would be like. But the book itself is actually inspired by the work of this man, early 19th century French illustrator uh, called uh, Jean-Ignace Isidore Girard, who worked under the pseudonym of J.J. Uh, Granville. And I've had this book for a while, and uh, it was just one day I was looking at it, and I suddenly thought, Granville, that could be the name of Paris in an alternative reality where it's the biggest city in the world and it's populated by animals. I thought, and I wanted to do a detective story for a while. I thought, yeah, detective, an English detective, of course, has to go to Paris. And that was just like that. That, that was where the idea came from. I wish it was so easy uh, with my other books. But as you can see, did these wonderful illustrations of anthropomorphic characters in contemporary dress. And I sort of moved it forward to uh, the Belle Epoque to sort of turn the century... Um, Paris, because I thought it was a more interesting sort of uh, time. I'm almost a steampunk uh, time. And uh, Granville, he was a big influence on John Tenniel, who, of course, did the uh, first Alice and Alice Through the Looking Glass uh, illustrations. I think you'll be able to see how big uh, an influence he was. If you look at this picture, this veal, the, the face here, then compare it to the face of the mock turtle, uh, in the famous pitch from Alice. Of course, Alice is full of anthropomorphic characters. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the influence there. The thing is, these are not new. These anthropomorphic stories aren't new. There's been anthropomorphic stories around as long as people have told stories. I mean, this cave painting from the, uh, the Trois-Freux cave in southern France, this, they don't know how old it is. It could be up to 750,000 years old. And you can see it has an anthropomorphic character, you know, said to be a shaman, but an anthropomorphic character. And there's anthropomorphic characters in all the world's mythologies and religions. Here's Ganesh from the Hindu mythology. Of course, the Roman and Greek uh, myths have anthropomorphic stories in them, such as Leader and the Swan uh, here, or Zeus. I mean, I don't know, it's with Zeus. I mean, the character would be very attractive. He keeps having to turn into animals and things to get laid. Uh, there's another one story where it turns into a bull, and even another one where it turns into a shower of gold. Well, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, the, in all the mythologies, there's another uh, Hindu deity, Hanuman, the monkey god, uh, who's he's one of the central characters of the Ramayama, and he's very closely related to the Chinese Sun Wu King, who's the, uh, the monkey king of, of, of the uh, legends. Of course, remade into a Japanese TV story, you may remember Monkey. Um, and there are other anthropomorphic characters in these stories. So you can see they've always, they've always been around. Um, the Egyptian gods, you've got Anubis and Horus and Sekhmet and uh, Thoth over there. So you have lots of the past. There's other ones. Even in, even in the Bible, you know, the first chapter starts out with an anthropomorphic snake in the Garden of Eden. So they've been there since the year dot. But yet the real father, I think, of the, the modern anthropomorphic story is not Aesop, who told these fables about animals in the 6th century BC. He was a freed slave, uh, and he told stories of you know, the, the, the fox and the crow and the tortoise and the hare, uh, the ant and the grasshopper. This is from a series of Victorian um, cards, collectible cards illustrating Aesop's fables drawn by Charles H. Bennett, who did a lot of work for Punch, including sequential stuff. He did sort of comic, uh, a lot of comic uh, illustrations. These were sort of collectible <coughs> cards. And he was sort of mid-19th century, so um, sort of overlaps with, with Granville. 
But these stories after Aesop continued in folklore and fairy tales throughout the years. It's just after all illustration of Red Riding Hood. But not just in Europe. I mean, all over the world I'm talking about. The, there's a whole raft of stories of African-American legends and, and folklore and tales, a lot of them concerning this Br'er Rabbit, this Br'er Rabbit character. And a lot of these stories, they, I mean, they, they came over with the, the slaves from, uh, from Africa, from Central Africa, where they had lots of legends of anthropomorphic characters, such as Anansi, the spider god, who's a trickster character, just like Br'er, Br'er Rabbit. And when they reached America, these stories sort of blended with the Cherokee Indian stories of the trickster rabbit. And you have Br'er Rabbit. Um, the, the, in 1881, uh, this Joel uh, Chandler, uh, Harris, Joel Chandler Harris, he collected together these stories. Now, he didn't write them. He didn't make them up. He just documented them. These are stories that were being told. Many other people documented them as well, including uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uncle. But uh, uh, Harris's ones are remembered now today because he invented a character as a framework of telling these stories uh, called Uncle Remus, who's the person who sort of tells these stories. And um, he did seven books altogether, collections of these, these anthropomorphic stories. And he actually did a comic strip, which I've got here. He'd, I think there's about 14 or 15 episodes of it. And it was actually drawn by J.M. Cond, who was the illustrator of the Uncle Remus stories. So this is one of the first printed comic strips and in English, in England. And as you can see, it's anthropomorphic anthropomorphic strip. This is actually a piece of political propaganda. It's uh, what's called a broadsheet, it's a political broadsheet. These would be printed and handed out and they act in exactly the same way that, say, you know, satirical strips act today. And um, stop me if you've heard this before, but uh, this is actually criticising the alliance between the Tories and the Liberals, <laughs> then called the Whigs, in this unholy coalition because neither of them had enough support on their own, you know. And um, it's 1782. Um, plus la change, plus la même chose, you know. Um, but it, it, it was criticising uh, James Fox, the Liberal, the Whig, and um, Lord North, the Tory, leader of the Tories, uh, in this alliance. And here you can see, uh, you know, Satan uniting them in this unholy marriage. <laughs> Loves and the Fox and the Badger. 1782, by Thomas Rawlinson, the famous um, English watercolourist and illustrator. And you can see it has all the ingredients of a modern comic strip. It has sequential panels. You know, it has speech balloons. It even has thoughts bubbles. You can see these little thing, uh, images of what the animals uh, are thinking in here. This book was published in 1851, uh, comical Creatures from Wurthenburg, and it's based on a series, it's 20 stories and 20 illustrations, based on a series of 20 tableaux that appeared at uh, the Great Exhibition in 1851. Um, anybody know what the population of Britain was in about that time? Um, all that many, but millions of people saw this exhibition. This must have been quite influential, millions of people saw this. And the tableaux were of stuffed animals in anthropomorphic poses. Um, and here's another fox and a badger. I've chosen this one. It's another fox and a badger because it seems to be this theme of a fox, the antagonism between foxes and badgers. This is supposed to be a badger here, I think. Uh, and they were from Wurttemberg in Germany. They're on loan from uh, Germany. But lots of people, millions of people must have seen, seen these pictures. Another fox and a badger. This time from Beatrix Potter, um, Tale of Mr. Todd. And here they are having a fight in the badger's house. And uh, I mean, uh, there must have been something in the air, I think, when Beatrix Potter was around, because a lot of the people I'm going to be showing you next are exact, almost exact contemporaries of Potter. Perhaps this came, uh, this influenced by the you know, Great Exhibition thing, I don't know. But um, be, people tend to think of Potter as being quite twee and acute, but a lot of her stories are very dark. I mean, the first one, uh, Peter Rabbit, um, 1905, the first book. It's all about the gar gardener chasing this rabbit to try and put it in a pie. I mean, it's already eaten its father. Um, 
in this book, Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Buddy arrive here to try and rescue uh, Benjamin Buddy's babies that have been kidnapped by the badger because he wants to eat them. And when they get to the outside of the lure here, they grow this dusty ground. It's all littered with rabbit bones and rabbit skulls. And then they say, well, you, so I, I don't think they'd allow these sort of things in children's books today. They wouldn't get published. In, in her longest book, The Fairy Caravan, uh, there's this chapter in the middle where a character eats Amanita muscaria mushroom, fly garret mushroom, and, and hallucinates for a chapter. I can't imagine this being in children's books <laughs> today. But, um, anyway, I've got a... It's my, I continued this tradition, so I have, a, I have a conflict with my badger policeman and a fox, this fox assassin in the story. That's why I, had a, I chose a fox for the, when I first, for the leader of the assassins. Um, yeah, LeBrock, he has all the deductive abilities of Sherlock Holmes, but being a badger is a bit of a bruiser, so he's quite happy to beat the crap out of a suspect, you know, to get information. You know, that's one of the reasons I chose a badger as the main character, because they're, they're quite ferocious and they're quite tenacious, and the two qualities that I wanted uh, LeBrock to have. Is it a reference, another reference, well, a reference to Potter in the story? Is this, this is Tiggy Wintle in Granville Bonhomme. So the... the, the at her husband's funeral. Oops. Now, Randolph Caldicott, who was 20 years older than Potter, uh, who, by the way, she, she was born in 1866 and died in 1943, and a lot of these people I'm talking about are, around, are really around that time. He was born about 20 years before, but he was a big influence on Potter. Uh, this is from, he did a lot of these children's books on animals, and this is from uh, Froggy Wood, a wooing girl. See the froggy doing his wooing here. But if anybody's seen Beatrix Potter's rat book, you know, Taylor Samuel Whiskers, you'll see that the rat's almost identical to Caldicott's uh, rat here. A character I'm going to have in the future, Granville book. Actually. So the Caldicott picture, let's have a mad dog. And I must admit, this is a very extremely tenuous link because in, uh, in Granville Modern Moor, I have a mad dog as well. Uh, literally a mad dog serial killer. Called Mastock. Anybody heard of Lewis Wayne? <coughs> Nobody heard of Lewis Wayne? Crumbs, he's been incredibly famous. He's sometimes known as the Cat Man. Um, another contem exact contemporary of Potter, within a year or two either side. Um, he was just famous for drawing cats. I mean, he was bonkers about cats, he was crazy about them. He started off, his, his early work was very naturalistic. You know, very realistic drawings of cats, but very soon they became sort of cute and cartoony and weirder and weirder. And, I mean, basically he spent the last 10 or 20 years of his life in Bedlam, in St. Mary's of Hospital, uh, St. Mary's of Bethlehem Hospital, where, you know, he was uh, schizophrenic. Um, so he, he, he was potty about cats, literally. This is a comic strip he did. He lived in uh, New York for, for three years, and he actually did a comic strip based on cats. Did Ronnie Lidon, it was just cats. This is Tom Cat as a waiter. But these are two pictures he did when he was in Bedlam. Now look at these. These were done in the 1930s. They look like 60s psychedelia, don't they? They're amazing. These fractal cats. Have here. Incredible <coughs> pictures. But yeah, he was immensely, immensely famous. Uh, another contemporary of Potter, this time uh, Benjamin Rabier uh, in France, who did lots of these um, books for children with anthropomorphic animals in. But he's probably best known now, best remembered now for Lavash Kiri, which is still used to advertise cheese to this day. France. Do you, you, pro you probably think you remember these, but I don't, I, I don't think you do. I think you're thinking of something else I'm going to show you next. Uh, these were uh, three of a series of 16 illustrations, that, oil paintings that were commissioned at the turn of the century from uh, T.M. Coolidge, another Potter uh, contemporary, to um, uh, promote, to advertise cigars. It was a series of cigar adverts. He was, he was paid to um, produce them. And they had dogs smoking pipes, playing poker, play, you know. I love, I love the bulldog here passing the card. Have you seen it with, it, with a foot under the table? That's great. Um, but he did these posters, but he was a big influence on um, Arnold Cern, Arthur Cern, sorry, who produced a whole series of these prints in, in the 50s, and you're probably thinking about these. These were the biggest selling prints in Britain and America 
during the 50s. And you can actually still see these on pub walls these days with little, little faded prints in it. And if you look, they have the same cast of animals in, in each um, picture. The same, the same animals uh, sort of repeat. Um, so I do have, in Granville, they do have a guest appearance. In, in one panel, you can see the, the sand dogs here playing pool. Another contemporary of Potter, uh, this time German, uh, Henrik Clay, he did a whole series of lovely pen and ink drawings based on anthropomorphic creatures. You perhaps might recognise this. Illustration by E.H. Shepherd. From Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, published in 18, uh, 1908. Made a lot more famous, actually, in 1928, when A.A. A. Milne, who, you know, also famous for the anthropomorphic book, Pooh Corner, House on Pooh Corner, he reworked Wind in the Willows as a stage play called Toad of Toad Hall, and uh, it became even more uh, famous. But this is a, a ratty and mole in Mole's living room having a chat. And I think this was a big influence on Granville because in Wind of the Willows, the most capable character is the badger. Um, but yeah, there's uh, the rat ratty and mole in the mole's living room. And in Granville, I have a little nod to this. I have a, a scene with uh, the rat having a chat with the mole in his living room. Uh, the rat in this case, it's uh, LeBrock's sidekick. He's Watson, if you like, to um, at LeBrock's homes, his adjunct. Um, and he's named, he's named Roderick Ratsy, Detective Roderick Ratsy. And he's named after this character. Yeah, have you recognised these? Yeah. yeah. Tales of the Riverbank is apparently the longest running TV series in the world. They go in 1958, 1957, I think, actually. And it's still running in one form or other today. It's, it disappears for a few years and then somebody makes it again. It keeps coming back and remakes. It's obviously not the original animals being used, isn't it? So. This was actually the hero, Hammy, Hammy the Hamster. And uh, there's, no, there's a third character in it, uh, the, the, the guinea pig, by the hilarious name of GP. Um, but you see all these little props and things, like these motorboats and typewriters and pianos and things. And the, uh, the, the filmmakers used to, they used to smear the keys with, 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 with cheese so it looked like they were typing or playing the piano. You know, they're actually trying to get some cheese out. In one episode, I seem to remember these unfortunate animals ended up in a, in a hot air balloon. They just released and let went up in the air, you know. Um, and uh, it was actually, I, I've not seen it, but in 2007 there was a movie, a feature-length movie came out with uh, Steve Coogan doing the voice of Roderick. I can't quite imagine it, but so uh, Yeah, Johnny Morris, of course, used to do the voice in the, in the, in the, in the 60s version. Uh, these are a set of um, Woodland Snap cards from late 40s, uh, early 50s, by the strangely named Racy Helps, um, who was very well known at the time, he did lots and lots of these children's books of an with animals, and uh, beautiful, I mean, they're very uh, Potter-influenced, but they're beautiful pictures, look at this, Mr. Cunningly Sly, uh, the fox here, that's, uh, that's lovely. Um, this one for an earlier set. Uh, Woodland Happy Families in the 30s. Now, I don't know who did these. It's anonymous and it's not signed at all. But yeah, you can see the Potter influence very definitely. He's a badger, you know, a working class badger. Like my, my, my badger's a working class one. Uh, but I've enlarged this one here, a Master Hedgehog, because he's reading a comic. He's reading comic cuts, which that, along with Chips, was the first British children's comic. Now, you may not know, but the first comics, the first British comics, were actually for an adult readership. They were, they, were, they were adult comics. They were satirical. You know, they appeared in Punch. They appeared as uh, supplements in newspapers now and again. Comic supplements, as they were called, which were the name to describe the medium comes from. Comic meaning humorous, of course. And this freelance journalist called Alfred Harmsworth, I mean, the most famous one was Alice Loper's Half Holiday, the most famous sort of... Um, what, what's remembered now most, but uh, Alfred Harmsworth saw that some children, it was at a friend's house, he saw some children looking at this and enjoying them, and he thought, well, can they enjoy those, the political commentary and whatever. And he, he got the idea, they like looking at the pictures, they like following the stories in the pictures. And he thought, I'll publish a comic for children. 
<laughs> this is where the British children's comic tradition comes from, comics being something that children read. And uh, one of those comic cuts, he did two, one comic cuts and chips. Comic meaning funny, cuts meaning that the printing, the, the, like it comes to the worm woodcut, you know, for, to mean a printing technique. So it's basically comic prints. And these were phenomenally successful. They sold millions. They just took off. Um, within a few years, he was producing dozens of comics, children's comics. And he had dozens of imitators also producing children's comics. Um, and they were bought up. They were very popular. He made so much money on these two comics. Um, within two years, he'd um, established two national newspapers, the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror. Within a couple of years, he'd acquired the Observer and the Times. And within a few more years, he had the biggest publishing empire in the world. And he was later made uh, Lord Northcliffe. Um, all from these comics, these children's comics. And uh, they were absolutely massive. Uh, I think we've got, yeah. This is another one of his comics that he did. Uh, but this character here is Tiger Tim. Anybody heard of Tiger Tim? It's amazing, isn't it? Because uh, he's a hugely famous Tiger Tim, massively famous. He wasn't just in The Rainbow. He, was, he had his own comic, Tiger Tim's Weekly. He was in <coughs> Puck. Uh, he was in other comics. But in 19, 1904, he made history basically by, by becoming the first British newspaper strip. It was Tiger Tim in the Daily Mirror. And uh, lasted um, until the 60s. He was, in, he was in the Daily Mirror for, um, for ages. And he was immediately immensely popular, even with adult readers. He was so popular, people were buying the Daily Mirror just to read Tiger Tim's stories. You know, and eventually, Beaver, uh, Palmsworth, he thought, hey, Daily Mail could do with a bit of this. You know, not, yeah, so in 1915, the um, Daily Mail started producing, they hired, oh, that was Julius Stafford Baker who did uh, Tiger Tim. They paid this illustrator, Charles Folkard, to come up with a character from them, and he came up with Teddy Tail. Now, who's heard of Teddy Tail? Hands up if you've heard of Teddy Tail. See, it's incredible how fleeting is fame, eh? You know, I mean, he was huge. He was a household name, Teddy Tail. He was massive. Um, he would t the slogan was Teddy Tail in the Daily Mail. Everybody knew who Teddy Tail was. There was, I mean, it's all ephemera, this stuff, but you can't find much of it around these days. It's designed not to last very long, but this is a few things I found. Some on the internet, some at the Bethnal Hall, um, Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood and things. But uh, the stuffed toys of Teddy Tail, jigsaws, you name it, the stamp sets, letter, letter writing sets, there's a Teddy Tail Club, Teddy Tail League. Um, there was even records, there were 78 records, you know, of songs about Teddy Tail that were played on BBC Radio. He was just nationally famous figure. And people, again, people were buying the Daily Mail just to read the Teddy Tail stories. Incredible. So, what happened next is... 1920, the editor of the Express, which was owned by Hamsworth rival, big rival, Lord Beaverbrook, another big press baron, he thought, I want some of this action, some of this anthropomorphic comic action. Uh, so he paid uh, an illustrator called Mary, Cald Mary Caldwell to create a character for the Daily Express. Uh, the editor's name was um, Herbert Tortell, and uh, reader, uh, she married him. She's more better known now as Mary Tortell. Yeah, signature there in the corner. And the Rupert strips are like two panels a day with a little bit of text underneath, meant to be read out to kids. Because it, basically it was a nursery comic that she did, created with Rupert. In the first and it, it, it installments, they lasted for several weeks, these stories. In the first one, Rupert didn't even have a name. He was just this little, little Burr Lost, he was called. And uh, Mary tells Rupert's stories, they were very... Like I said, they were very lightweight. They were very, uh, they're not furry stories, little light, light stories. And Rupert only really took off as a character when Alfred E. Bestall took over in 1935 and started, as well as doing the weekly uh, comic strip, he also started producing these beautiful watercolour painted line and watercolour wash uh, annuals, which are still produced to this day. Um, he retired in the 70s, um, but um, they're still continued by other artists. 
and um, Bestol introduced a strong sort of heroic adventure element to Rupert and upped the age level a bit, science fiction and fantasy element. You know, Rupert would go off on these fantastic adventures, you know, he'd go up to see cities in the clouds or whatever, or, or to South Sea Islands or, or whatever. And he'd always return to home at the end, you know, of the, of the story. And uh, he's, he was based in the village called Nutwood, which you can see here, which was actually based on, Bestel had a cottage in Beth Gellet in northern Wales, and it was based on, on that sort of village. I think his father still, you know, still wears plus four to this day, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, th th that was Nutwood, his, his village, which in Granville, I actually start, start off near the beginning of the story, it starts with a murder in Nutwood. This is basically Ru Rupert Burr's village. And that's Rupert Burr's face there. And that's Rupert Burr's dad mowing the lawn. Um, and when they're actually leaving, you can see at the side of the thing, you see Rupert Burr's dad <laughs> trimming the hedge in, in the background. And even on the... On, oops. All right. um, and there's a badger in Rupert Burr. I think this is another, one, another reason that I used a badger as a protagonist. Because uh, Rupert had lots of friends, but... In my mind, his coolest friend was Bill the Badger. And I think it's something to do with the black and white markings, I don't know. But, you know Bill was, his, uh, was the coolest one. And when they're leaving the, the village after the little investigation on the way back to London, you can see the, the railway uh, sign as Nutwood in the background. Uh, can't go much further without mentioning Crazy Cat, which appeared from 1914. Uh, syndicated in quite a few American papers about a cat by George Harriman, um, a cat to mouse. It's like, it's like this strange romantic triangle. Uh, the cat, crazy cat, which who's asexual in the story. You don't know uh, what gender he is. Um, he loves the mouse, Ignat's mouse. Um, the, the dog loves the cat, and the mouse just exists to try and brain the cat with a brick. So that's the <laughs> setup. And it was seen as very avant-garde at the time. It was taken seriously by a lot of the intellect intellectuals. And there was a ballet based on it. There was an opera based on it. Uh, it was partly to do with the, like, the surrealist changing landscapes. And bear in mind, this, is, this predates the surrealist movement by six years. Um, but partly the way he used language. He had a very playful way of using, of using language. Big influence on Hunt Emerson, of course, contemporary illustrator who Hunt used to go around at one point with a badge that said Harriman is God uh, on it. But yeah, anthropomorphic characters. Meanwhile they continued in British children's comics. This Roy Wilson, he was very well known for doing them. He did dozens of these over decades. Uh, this is from the 1944 um, Radio Fun um, annual. A very sort of distinctive style. Very big influence on a lot of people who followed him in British uh, kids' comics. And this is contemporary with him, La Bete Mort by uh, Edmond Francois uh, Calvo, um, which is basically, it's the story of the Second World War, uh, told in anthropomorphic terms, using animals. And this was done, it first came out in two volumes. You can now get them all in one volume. And it's certainly not a children's story. You know, they're very, it's very dark. The scenes of piles of corpses and people hanging from lampposts and all sorts of things. And this began uh, to be produced. Most of this, the first half of it, was produced almost literally under the noses of the German occupying forces in Paris. He was doing it, doing it then. It's certainly uh, quite a dark book. Uh, I've, I've included Toby Twirl Annual just to show you how um, popular these anthropomorphic annuals were, because Toby Twill didn't appear in a, a newspaper magazine. He just existed as uh, an annual character. Um, they were all written by Sheila Hodgetts and drawn by E. Jeffries, um, and he just did one a year. I, I was quite, never quite sure why he was called Toby Twill. Presumably it's because he's got a pig's tail, a curly tail, but you never see the tail, they're too modest. It's, uh, it never pokes out from the back of his... You think he'd have a little hole in the back of his... His uh, overalls there, but no. It's very famous. Uh, Uncle Scrooge. Anybody know the names of his nephews? Yeah, very, very, very famous. The, there have been Disney comics uh, in newspapers, Disney strips in newspapers since the 1930s. But in the 40s, um, I think it was Universal Publishing, they started to produce 
actual Disney uh, comic books. Uh, but it really only in the 50s when Carl Barks came on board and started drawing Uncle Scrooge that they really, you know, became something really special. And uh, Uncle Scrooge had these fantastic adventures where he'd go off and discover Atlantis or El Dorado or somewhere, and usually with his nephews in tow, and, um, and then come, come back at the end. But he's uh, basically a miser, uh, a millionaire miser. And in Granville Monomur, I do have a, a little, past, a little uh, cameo appearance of Uncle Scrooge <laughs> in the corner there. And also his nephew, Donald Duck, which, uh, as you can see here, is, <laughs> he was known as uh, Toilet Duck in this uh, reality. But, um, yeah, I, it's strange because the, although the, in recent years the, the, the Disney comics have actually, they're not as popular in America as they used to be. 50s, they were huge. They're still hugely popular in Europe, in the rest of the world, especially in, well, I mean, in, in lots of countries in Europe. In, in uh, Italy, Topolino, which is the Italian for Mickey Mouse, that's, it's still one of the biggest selling publications in Italy. In, in Denmark, uh, Annas Ang, who's uh, Don Duck's name in, uh, in Danish, it means Anders Duck, yes, sir. Um, that sells, the Don Duck Weekly there, it sells uh, a million copies a week. Now, in a, in a country that has a population of just over five million, I mean, this is pretty good going, I think. Um, I mean, obviously a bit of seepage over the borders, but... That's a pretty impressive uh, sales figure. Keep going back to the British tradition. The uh, Beano the Dandy appeared from 1938 onwards, so the 50s uh, edition. Both of them, of course, had um, anthropomorphic characters on the, on the cover, Biff or the Burr here. Uh, Dandy had Corky the Cat, and there were characters inside. This was drawn by uh, D. Dudley Watkins, who did the desperate, invented Desperate Dan and did the Ur Woolley strips and the Bruins in Scotland. Um, but inside, people like Leo Baxendale, who in the 50s, in the early 50s, along with um, Ken Reid and David Law, they reinvented the children's comic with characters like the, you know, the Bash Street Kids and Minnie the Minks and stuff like this, these anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment figures. Um, and Leo Baxendale did several anthropomorphic strips, such as The Gobbles, uh, A Family of Vultures, and, and the three bears, you know, from uh, Goldilocks, things like that. The other thing from the 50s is from a comic called Jack and Jill, um, which was drawn by H.M. Tallentire, who in the interwar years, the Daily Mail actually had a comic supplement for children called uh, the Un Uncle Ujar's newspaper. And this is Uncle Ujar from it. Uh, he appeared in Jack and Jill in this colour strip. Although this strip was called uh, Jerry, Don and Snooker. There were these three characters. Uh, one of them's his nephew. But I this surreal. Isn't it weird to look at? I mean, I read this nursery comic before I could read. My parents bought me this comic. So I'm sort of steeped in, in this sort of thing. I mean, the, the, my Christmas present every year was the um, Rupert the Bear annual from my dad. Um, but yeah, I always... I, I, this is actually from the book that I had when I was five. I've, st I've still got it. And it used to give me the creeps then, looking at this. <laughs> Somehow I found it fascinating. This um, weird, weird sort of style. It's a bit of a jump, but <laughs> I'll jump into the mid-60s. Where I, I mentioned that the comics, the original comics, were for an adult readership. And they became a medium for children. They became taken over as a medium for children. And it was only in the 1950s when the comics of the counterculture, the hippie comics, the anti-establishment comics, reclaimed comics as a medium for adults. And, I mean, these uh, underground comics led directly to the graphic novel boom of today. These fed into the sensibilities of people like Alan Moore, and, you know, people who were inventing the, 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 the genre. Uh, Fritz the Cat, my... Robert Crumb, who's probably the most well-known American underground cartoonist. There's Coochie Cootie here by Robert Williams, very surreal sort of artist. And uh, Wonder Warthog by Gilbert Shelton, who's probably better known for Fabulous Fairy Freak Brothers. But uh, I'm sort of going to start jumping now through the years, just showing you what sort of... Um, how, how, how the anthropomorphic comics have continued... Um, I mean, Commander was actually a big influence on me on Granville, I'm sure. 
it was by Jack Kirby after he left Marvel. Jack Kirby, of course, created all these fantastic characters for Marvel, like the Fantastic Four and the Hulk and the uh, Incredible Thor, X-Men. And uh, he, he was very dissatisfied with Marvel. He left, he went to DC. And one of, this is one of the comics that he did there, which is basically, it was conceived of as a cash-in on the Planet of the Apes movies. Uh, the editor, Carmen Infanto, asked Jack Kirby to create something like Planet of the Apes. It was big, massive, very popular. Um, he actually tried to buy the rights to the Planet of the Apes, but he couldn't get them. So he asked Kirby to do, um, to do a version. Well, Kirby didn't have to. He'd already done one. In 1957, he'd done this strip called The Last Enemy in Harvey Comics, Alarm, uh, Harvey, yeah, Harvey Comics Alarming, Alarming Comics or Alarming Tales, something like that. And he'd done this strip with you know, anthropomorphic creatures, animals, a post-apocalyptic future. And these actually predate, this actually predates the Planet of the Apes novels. So Kirby had actually done it first. And basically, Commandy was a, a continuation of his ideas in this Latin strip, The Last Enemy. It, it didn't just have leopards in it, it had all sorts of animals. Um, but yeah, it was a sort of a very you know, science fiction adventure story. with the duck by Steve Gerber and Gene Colan, which was um, in, the, in the early 70s. It was one of the first sort of humour comics uh, from Marvel. It was a satire comic. Uh, in the year this came out, they actually ran Howard the Duck for president against Carter. He said, Carter yells foul, it says here. Um, assassination attempt defended by a gunman. Thought he was in season, says assassin. <laughs> um, no, it's a funny, funny, funny story. I, I still have actually the Howard for president badge at home. Um, 1977, Dave Sim started pubs, self publishing, uh, Cerebus the Aardvark. And uh, what started as a quite a silly sort of spoof of the Roy Thomas, um, Barry Smith, uh, Conan the Barbarian comics, pretty soon became the most um, sort of uh, comic that was pushing the barriers and doing all sorts of new things with comics. It was very experimental. And you can see here, I was, he's experimented with speech balloons, sound effects, and he, he did lots of silent sequences. He really sort of tr played around with what the media uh, could do. And it carried on going. It did um, 300 issues, finished in 2004, um, a total of uh, 6,000 6, pages. And it's, it's, it's available. It's all still available now in, in these what he calls form book collections. Uh, 1986. It had been serialized before Mouse, but uh, the first volume came out in 86. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, heard of Mouse by Art Spiegelman. Uh, the first comic to win the Pulitzer Prize, and it mainly concerned his father's experience in Auschwitz um, during the, the Second World War. And in the story, as you can see, the mice, the Jews are represented by mice, and the Nazis by cats. Uh, 1984 um, saw the first uh, pub issue of uh, Usagi Yojimbo by Stan Sakai, and it's amazing. It's still, I mean, it's still coming out now. And Stan's never missed a month. Bang, bang, one a month. Um, this is quite a recent one. You can see it's up to 117 now. I don't know what the, this is, not 2008. Uh, Usagi means rabbit <coughs> in Japanese. Uh, Yojimbo means bodyguard. And he obviously, he, he, he took the title from the Kurosawa film uh, about um, the samurai who goes to the village. And, uh, defend, you know, uh, takes on two gangs at once. You know, it was later he made, of course, a uh, fish, fistful of dollars. And um, then Last Man Standing a bit later on. Published the same year, Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was sold, another self-published comic. Um, Kevin Eastman and David... L David Eastman, Kevin Ladd. Is that right? No, it's Kevin Eastman. Kevin Eastman and... Yeah. Um, it was done by... Uh, one of them, I can't remember which one, uh, got some sort of tax rebate, and together with a loan from an uncle, they self-published this. Um, within a few short years, they were multimillionaires. Um, I know about four years into it, I mean, mainly because it got taken on by a, a cartoon network and they made to a movie. About four years later, they'd each made, I think, $80 million a piece then. So they continued making this money um, all the time. 
It's a huge hit. I mean, one time you couldn't walk down a street without seeing Mutant Ninja Turtle balloons or cakes with Mutant Ninja Turtle faces on them. Omaha the Cat Dancer, which is, uh, came out from eight, um, when was this? This was 90, 91 or so, I think it started uh, being produced. Uh, erotic comic, uh, well, actually, pornographic comic, I don't mince words, um, uh, with the cat, well, anthropomorphic characters. Um, she's, a, she's a cat. Uh, Kate sadly died a few years ago, but uh, I hear that it's uh, NBM uh, are currently uh, doing new Omaha stories written by somebody else, but still drawn by Reed Waller. And in Granville, if you have a little tribute to Omaha, I have an Omaha poster in the background here. Just in the, in the Folie Berger. Another anthropomorphic character, this time a bone, anthropomorphic bone, basically, uh, by Jeff Smith. Uh, this is a fantasy epic. It's well over a 1,000 pages long, published in a series, self-published again, in a series of books, been immensely popular, sold a lot of copies. And Jeff's very influenced by um, the Uncle Scrooge stories. You know, there's a quest, Uncle Scrooge quest stories, also Lord of the Rings. And also an American newspaper strip called Pogo, which I really should include in this, but I've not got around to it yet. Um, but yes, it's a fantastic uh, fantasy story. You see it involves dragons, and it's very Lord of the Rings-ish. A contemporary uh, strip called uh, Hip Flask, the main character, Hieronymus Flask, who's a, a private eye. It's like a science fiction private, private eye scenario. Uh, draw, written by Richard Starkins, and this one's drawn by Ladron, who does these beautiful, he textured illustrations. Uh, and the pages can apparently take him, take him up to a month uh, long, I mean, mainly because he'll, he'll get them to a certain level and then carry on working o o over them. It, you know, uh, there's only him who can see there's minute changes, but he'll, he'll, he'll slave over them. And apparently Richard, Richard Starkings, a writer, he tells me, that, tells me that very often he'll go around to his house and wait until he's out or he's making a coffee or something and go in and grab the pages he has on the desk and run out with them to get them to the publisher on time. He spends that much time over them. This is Black, I can't recommend this enough. Black Sad by uh, Canales and Guianido. Um, two Spanish... Uh, creators, uh, it was, but it was first published in France, where very quickly it sold 200,000 in the first few months, uh, and then it was published in other countries, but uh, if you, I really recommend these, they're, they're very film noir, Chandler-esque, uh, privatised stories set in 1950s Los Angeles, and the brilliant story is wonderfully um, executed, and you're very, if you've not read these, you're very lucky because Dark Horse has recently reprinted all three in one, the first three stories in one book in English. You can get them all in one book. Is it still in print? That? Yeah, it just came back in. Right. Mouse Guard, which is uh, another fantasy story, one of the animals, like Lord of the Rings with mice. So that's the anthropomorphic um, comics. I'm just going to show you now a couple of little things in, from, from Granville. As I said, it's set in uh, La Belle Epoque. It's the first page. The great thing about Eiffel Tower is you don't need a caption. Stick that there. Everybody knows it's, it's in Paris. <coughs> this is like a back of an ind industrial estate, uh, whatever. It starts off with this chase down the, uh, over the cobbles down the alleyways. And I was actually mortified when the Sherlock Holmes movie came out about three months later because it starts off with this carriage <coughs> rattling through these cobble streets. Um, and this carriage being chased by assassins. And believe me, it's a lot easier typing in, the assassins are wearing uh, steam-powered, piston-driven wheelie boots. It's a lot easier writing that than actually designing the things, let me tell you. But they were actually inspired by this French, old French illustrator, old French invention. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, uh, nothing ever came of it, I don't know why. But, uh, <laughs> you can see I've added the, um, the little engine and the pistons and things, but uh, yeah, that's where it comes from. This page in the story, Britain's connected bunch of France with, with Channel Bridge. Um, the idea is the train goes into this island at the bit, uh, in the middle of, of the channel and you have to change over here. It's called the Free Trade Zone and you go and get your train which takes to Paris and then this one comes back. Um, but this was inspired by, in the 70s, there were actually plans to build a, 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 a Channel Bridge 
including this uh, an island, artificial island in the middle. And if anybody has any, I, I've done searches, internet searches, trying to find these uh, conceptual drawings, which I saw in the 70s. They were in a colour supplement. Um, but I've not been able to find any. So if anybody does ever come across them, please email me and send me a copy. I'm going to zoom in on this little panel here because I want you to start spotting the references if you can. Is anybody can anybody spot the reference in here? Yeah? So inadvertently, inadvertently, no, it's a, it's a reference to this 1862 painting by Augustus Egg uh, called Travelling Companions. Now, I, I'll go back to it. You can see I've just done them as, as ostriches, basically. But it's a reference to them. But look at the hats that they're wearing on here. This was also referenced by John Tenniel in Alice. See the hat she's wearing? This, which was, this came out about nine years after the, the exhibition with, with that in. And look at, the, if you look at the windows, they're the same windows, these rounded windows and the same hat. Yeah, so you, you were right eventually. Yeah. Um, in Granville, it isn't just, there isn't just anthropomorphic characters, there's also humans, as you can see with these characters up here. Well, there's a, a bellboy here and... Uh, this character. And in the story, they're sort of second class citizens. They're like a, a human underclass who have no, no citizenship rights. They do, they're menial laborers. And uh, this one here is Becassine, who was 1905, she was the first ongoing French newspaper strip character. And arguably, she was actually the first female protagonist in comics. Um, she's still around to this day, Becassine. Although there's no comics, uh, the comics haven't been produced anymore, but uh, they exist as children's stories. And they're a lot more politically correct uh, <laughs> these days. The original joke in the Becca scene strip was she, she was this dumb hick from the sticks who came from Normandy or somewhere, and she was working as a, as a nurse for a posh family in Paris, and she made all these appalling social gaffes. You know, it's because she was stupid, she's from the country. You know. um, another character... And see, the doll faces are usually references to French comic characters. Uh, the the bellboy is a reference to an extremely famous French comic character called Spirou, who originally um, written and drawn by Robert Velmer um, from 1938 onwards. He's this bellboy has a bed. This guy is huge in France, massive, very popular, almost as popular as Tintin. Um, you go to the Angoulême Comic Festival and there's kids walking about in, in Spiru caps and things. You know, I mean, very popular character. Um, after Velmar died, um, uh, lots of other people drew it, including uh, André uh, Franquin. This is his version of Spiru. And this is from Granville Monomo. The, uh, these two characters here are in for about three pages. They're uh, a reference to these two French characters. This is Gaston Legaffe, uh, another character created by Frank Ham, um, also from the pages of the Spirou uh, magazine. And uh, Lucien, who's created by Frank Margaran after he finished working for Metal Erlon, uh, which became heavy metal. But uh, as you can see, there are different uh, versions of them. So the Frankan character, who's also massive in France, um, Marsupilami, you can buy Marsupilami stuffed toys and figurines and puzzles and all sorts of things. And in Granville Monomer, I have, uh, this is a scene in a brothel, I actually have a prostitute with a Marsupilami uh, costume in the background here. Of course, you probably get this reference here. In Granville Monomer, you see, you find it, the, the Prime Minister of Britain in the story, he's a bulldog, he'd have to be, wouldn't it? You know, it'd have to be a bulldog uh, called Harold Drummond. Officer actually a bulldog Drummond. He usually ends more sentences with the, oh, yes. Um, but he's, of course, from this picture, Churchill. Any spot the reference here? Probably the more famous one. No? I thought you'd have got this one. This is a, a reference to the absinthe drinker uh, by Edward Degas, famous impressionist painting. Another reference. Let me get this one. It's going to be self-evident, actually. 
It's from Granville Monomer. Just Rodan's The Kiss. Of course, actually, Rodan did actually want to use badges, but it was considered a bit controversial at the time. <laughs> um, but uh, I've used badges. Another reference here. Let me spot this one. Yeah, that's... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, Ed, Edward, Man, Edward Manet, Bar at the Folie Berger, which it is, yeah. uh, reference to that one. I do have Le Brock at the bar ordering a bottle of Bass <laughs> in the Folie Berger. And this is because they actually served Bass at the Folie Berger. Look, here's a, <laughs> two Bass bottles. This was at a time in prudish Victorian England when businessmen, they couldn't go anywhere racy like this in London. They had to go to Paris. So they used to import British beer to sell to them when they were, when they were there. And that's the panel I'm just showing you. And this is the, the two facing pages that, um, where it appears. I'm, I just want to show you this to show, get across the importance of when I'm designing a graphic novel. It's important to know which pages are facing which. Partly because you can keep the surprise over the, over the page. You have to turn the page to see what's coming next. So you don't put it down here. You don't put it on here. And a number of times I've read a superhero comic and there's somebody here saying, I wonder who Mr. X is, you know, Professor X, whatever. And you can see he's taking his mask off there. You'll see him. <laughs> because when you read a comic, you don't read it. You read the text in a linear manner, but you can't help it. Your eyes flit about all over. They take everything in. And then you assimilate the pictures in, 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 into a linear form. Um, it's, it's called panoptic reading. Uh, and that's how you take in a comic. But... Another thing about knowing which pages face which is that you can encapsulate an entire atmosphere within two pages. And it can have its own atmosphere. You can turn the page in a different atmosphere. So that's one of the reasons I always try and end a scene. Not always possible, but I always try and end a scene on a right-hand page. Another example of containing an atmosphere between its own two pages. Another thing about... I always create, I always draw the, the pages that face each other at the same time. I always design them at the same time. I design them in two-page sections after I've written the script and everything. I decide what's going to be in each panel and you know, how big the frames are going to be. And then I make sure that the proportions correspond so that they're harmonious. And what I've done here is I've, I mean, the next thing I do is, is draw the panel borders in ink so that when I draw a pencil, if I rub it out, they're still there. I can still see where they are. And then I draw, I pencil them in. So I've scanned in two of the pages and put them together on computer. And on Photoshop, I've just put these little lines in. And what they mean, all they mean is the, the arrows, the lines are the same colour. They're exactly the same length as each other. So this width, this width, it's the same as that height, or this width. These are squares, right? Uh, everything that's the same colour corresponds so they have a harmonious uh, balance. And this is what that, uh, this page looks like finished. You won't be able to see that. That's this page. These two pages. See, here I couldn't end this scene on the end of a page on, the end, on that side. So it's actually got a different ultimate background. It's got a black background which really marks it off from, from this bit. I'm going to zoom in on this panel here, which I quite like. Sarah Blurrow's uh, apartment in the story. Sarah Blurrow being loosely based on Sarah Bernhardt, the, the, the big French uh, star. And that's actually based on uh, Sarah Bernhardt's apartment. You see, it's, uh, it's quite sumptuous. Anybody spot the reference here? That's not... So it's just an opium den, which might give you a clue in the story. It's actually, if you look at the ladder and these things hanging up and everything, it's a reference to the famous Gustave Doré illustration um, of an opium den in London, a pilgrimage. There's the stairs. The cat's sitting on the stairs. I don't know if you see its eyes. There. Um, and in this opium den, there's a, he's gone there to question uh, this uh, character from information who's an opium addict. And uh, anybody recognise him? Yep. His name is actually in the story Snowy Milou. Uh, Milou is his, the name in the French Tantan albums. Yeah, he's, he's Snowy, of course. Here he is. And 
uh, while LeBrock's sort of interrogating him, <coughs> he keeps drifting off into his opium dreams, and he's saying, yeah, there was a crab with golden claws, and I think, you know, he's basically he's dreaming the Tintin adventures. Uh, actually, this, this struck a chord with a lot of people. It was only for a page and a half, but especially the French edition, a number of people who commented on this, who were moved by it, or poor Snowy, or, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> And I just want to say a little bit about, um, just about a tiny bit about visual storytelling, because when I design a page, I've shown you how I designed the two pages facing, uh, I always try and have a compositional line, a compositional flow through the panels to lead the eye on. And you can see, I've, this, I've put this here because it's very clear. You can see that very clearly. That's the compositional line going through these four panels. Here you can see it's a wavy line. If you look at the Fortal points of interest in each panel will follow this line. Here it's a straightforward line going up. Here it's a different one. It's sort of a like that, and then down and up and down. Here another straight line. Here too, but it's a horizontal line, and it almost helps to sort of push the character through the through the door. Very obvious one here, you can see the progression on these three panels. And here it's sort of wavy line. Here too. But very often I'll start, before pencilling anything, I'll start with the line, just go just like that through the panels, or up or across or whatever. And lastly, I'm just going to show you the different stages a page goes through. Um, when I'm doing it, because I still, I still like drawing by hand, you know. Um, so it, it's all penciled on a drawing board, the pencil. And then I uh, ink it with uh, a mixture of pens and brushes. You can use pens for nice straight lines and um, sharp lines, the brushes for more flowing lines like her or, or texture or, or garments. And then, oh, I'm just, that's just adding the um, add uh, thicker panel borders on Photoshop, and then the lettering, which I always keep on a separate layer. This is for foreign editions, because very often the words and the grammar means that they take up bigger space, so I always supply the files with a picture and the, the text on a different layer. Then the flat colours are, gone, are done, and this is, the only, um, sequ this is the only sequence I don't do in the entire book. I do everything else, from the pencils to the finished colouring and everything. But just to save me a little bit of time, I pay somebody to, um, to do the flat colours, which basically means that they'll pick out an area like the elephant's head, the blue coat, the white, the, the badger's head, and they'll colour it a flat colour, just flat colour, which makes it a bit easier for me. It saves me the time when I'm going through to do the final rendered colour, because it means I can just click on this and get the whole elephant there masked out, and I can just work on it. And it's very like working with brush. I use a Wacom tablet. It's, it's very much like painting with a brush. This is a finished colours. You can see I've changed some of them a little bit, like the, her dress. And uh, I've also dropped in the background on the, the panels. And then I add a tint. I think you saw that. I usually add a t tint to each scene, its own slight tint, to give each scene its own you know, add, add to its sense of having an, its own atmosphere. One of the few things I do to do that. And it's finally, you can see the bleed around the edge, which doesn't get actually printed. It's finally cropped. This is on a separate layer, the sort of uh, explosion, the gun flare. Yeah. And that's what it appears like in the eventual comic. So, um, yes, that's the end of the book. These are two books. I've got um, the next one scripted, and the next uh, two after that, loosely plotted out. So I want to do a series of these books. So that's the grammar books. Thank you. Right.